Hey, church family, my name is Renee O'Neill. We are so excited you have joined us online today to worship and hear from God's Word. We've loved hearing from you, and we want to continue to know what's going on in your life. Let us know how we can be supporting you and praying for you during this time. Email us at pray at fbcfm.com. Pastor Jeff is continuing today in the sermon series, Facing My Fears. We pray this message blesses you and grows you in your love for Jesus Christ. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name.
Glad you're with us today, whether you're online or on campus. You know, it's summertime, and even though it's COVID-19 is still around, uh, there's a lot of folks getting in those trips and getting in those vacations, and, and we're glad to get them wherever we can. But there's one trip that a lot of us take, but we don't really want to. But sometimes we're pretty regular in taking it, and that is a guilt trip. Uh, a trip that, that has us dwelling on and thinking about and focusing on guilt from some things in our past. In fact, as I really am convinced that many of the fears that we have in our life are rooted in guilt. Guilt about something from our past. And so we replay it in our brain. We, we wonder if I'll be found out someday or if somebody knew they might reject us or we're afraid that maybe someday we'll get retaliated against or most of all that God is just waiting to kind of zap us or judge us because of our guilt. And what I'm convinced of is that the enemy of our soul, Satan, would have you to keep focused on your past so that you'll just be distracted from God's work in your life in the present and what he wants to do through you in the future. But the good news is God has a different agenda. God wants us to operate not out of a fear of our past, but out of the freedom of His love and His grace toward us. In John's letter that we know as 1 John in chapter 4, he reminds us of the, the freedom that we can have in His grace. I'm going to begin reading in verse 15. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in Him and He in God. So we have come to know and believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence, now listen, for the day of judgment, because as he is, so also we are in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love cast out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. God wants us to have the freedom that comes from being perfected in His love and freed by His grace. Let's talk about guilt and, and some of the ways that we deal with it that are quite ineffective. And I'm going to call this plan B because all of these start with a B. Sometimes plan B looks like we try to bury it. We try to bury it. We try to bury our guilt. We try to, uh, one of the ways we do that is to minimize it. Uh, we try to say, you know, it's not that big a deal. It, now that I think about it, it's not so big. It's not so hard. Uh, we fail to, we try to bury it as if it's not a big thing. So maybe God won't take that much of offense. Or sometimes, not only minimize it, but we try to try to rationalize it. Try to rationalize it. It's not that big a deal. And besides, everybody's doing it. And yes, I did this thing, but so-and-so did this, or so-and-so did this, and somebody is a whole lot worse off than I am. And if I continue to minimize and rationalize, I will continue to compromise. To compromise. It's very easy over time when we try to bury our guilt. When I sin a couple of times in the same way, it begins not to seem as sinful in my mind. But here's the problem with trying to bury our guilt. It doesn't work. The Bible says, whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper. David, when he finally uh, came to th this understanding of his own sin, he, he looked back and he reflected on uh, how he tried to, to bury his guilt. And this is what he said, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. Burying our guilt doesn't work. Sometimes when I'm teaching on this or talking with somebody individually, I'll ask them to picture a beach ball. I hope you've ever had a beach ball at a swimming pool, and maybe you've tried to push it under the water, and maybe you've tried to hold it down with one hand or even both hands, or maybe even tried to sit on that beach ball, and you're going to keep it buried under the water. 
And you can do that for a while, but eventually it becomes this struggle, or eventually it pops out from under your hand or underneath your body, and it comes ripping back up to the surface. And that's what happens with guilt when we try to bury it. We can hold it down for a while, but sometimes it erupts back to the surface of our life. Sometimes in the most inopportune times, in the most inappropriate ways. Burying our guilt doesn't work. But sometimes we blame others. We blame others. We, we don't bury it, but we say, well, uh, it's really not my fault. And this way of in, in effectively dealing with our guilt is as old as creation. I mean, it goes back to the very first sin in the Garden of Eden. Uh, Adam in his rebellion and God confronted him with his sin. And he said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree and I Eight. I mean, Adam's going like for the daily double here, right? He's blaming his wife and he's blaming God for giving him this wife. And so he's really casting the blame upon others. And this, this is, becomes a pattern in our life. It can become a pattern because we become experts at accusing others and excusing ourselves. I accuse others, it's their fault, uh, it's not me, I excuse myself as I blame others. And a lot of this just rises out of this pattern of, of victimization, that I am a victim in all of this. And we use blame to try to diminish or dull our guilt. But like burying our guilt, it doesn't work. Sometimes we try to bury it. Sometimes we try to blame others. But sometimes we just beat ourselves up. We just beat ourselves up. This is uh, self-administered punishment, if you will. It's the, this sense of uh, I, I'm no good and I'm just going to constantly uh, beat myself up. You see a reflection of that in the 38th Psalm. For my iniquities have gone over my head like a heavy burden. They are too heavy for me. My wounds stink and fester because of my foolishness. I am utterly bowed down and prostrate. All the day I go about mourning. There, there is this sense of just a defeat and, and being beaten up. And this, this beating ourselves up manifests itself in a wide variety of ways. Sometimes it manifests itself in physical illness or sickness. Sometimes it shows up in, in depression. Sometimes it sets us up for ongoing failure because there's a part of us that feels like I don't deserve success. And so we uh, almost self-sabotage as we beat ourselves up. And an interesting display of this is sometimes we, we are judging ourselves and we also become very, very judgmental toward others. And it arises from these ineffective ways of dealing with our guilt. You see, a guilty conscience doesn't know when to quit. It doesn't know when to give up. But God has a better way. If that was plan B, I want to give you God's plan A. And these all start with A. The first is to admit it. To admit it. Instead of trying to bury it, I admit it. I own it. In 1 John, the same letter we just read from, says, If we say we have no sin... We deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. It is deceiving ourselves because God's not fooled and nobody else is fooled if, if we don't own it, if we don't admit it. Proverbs 20 says, The spirit of man is the lamp of the Lord, searching all his innermost Parts, that, that God has this way of, of searching and, and calling out the sin in us. Lamentations calls us to let us test and examine our ways and return to the Lord. So let me suggest to you a helpful exercise. It's not necessarily for every day, but there are times where it's just good to, to set aside some time and get still before the Lord and get a Pencil and paper, pen and paper, or keyboard, whatever works best for you. But I think there's something powerful in writing this down. And just lay it before the Lord and just say, Lord, help me to see myself. Search my heart. Help me to test and examine my way. 
And they just begin to, to record, to write out any sin that God brings to mind. This is not morbid introspection for beating ourselves up. It's just for saying, God, I'm not going to keep trying to keep that beach ball underwater. But let's bring it to the surface where we can start to deal with it. Getting it out is the first step in dealing with guilt God's way. And so I admit it. I, I proclaim that it is mine. And let's get specific in this. Not these generals, God, sorry for all my sins. But what specifically is God seeking to address in your life? And as you admit it, accept responsibility for it. Accept responsibility for it. David, again, is he, he, he had tried to cover up this sin, particularly this egregious sin in the, the episode with Bathsheba and her husband Uriah. And he, he finally caved after he was confronted to, to admit it. And in part of that admitting it, he owned it. He accepted responsibility. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. <laughs> God, no more, no, no more blaming, uh, no more putting it off on somebody else. Uh, she shouldn't have been there. He shouldn't have done this. No, 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 no. God, it's me. My transgressions, my sin. My sin that first and foremost was an affront to you. He accepted responsibility for it. James encourages us, therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. That there is something about, about getting them out and owning them. And that doesn't necessarily mean you broadcast every sin to everybody. But are there a, a few safe people in your life that you can be real and open and honest with? It may be that you even need to establish a formal relationship with a, with a Christian counselor just to have that safe environment to admit, to accept responsibility, to own some of these things that you've tried to bury or you've tried to blame somebody else for for too long. It's been said that I am only a sick is my secrets. And there are a lot of folks that are walking around with a sickness because they're trying to keep these things buried. They're trying to blame and justify their actions. The revealing your feeling, it's been said, is the beginning of healing. So that when I admit it, when I accept responsibility for it, when I begin to, to grieve it and, and mourn over it and, and turn from it, it, it is in getting that out. That's why James says to confess our sins and to pray for one another that you may be healed. It is in owning that, accepting that. And then the third A is to ask. Ask God to forgive it. Instead of beating myself up, I ask God to forgive. In this same letter of 1 John, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And when I teach on this, I usually like to remind people, uh, we, we oftentimes use this verse in, in maybe sharing our faith in evangelism, but this is a letter John is writing to believers. And he's reminding them uh, that even as we deal with our sin, let's own it, let's admit it, let's accept responsibility for it, let's confess it, see it the same way, speak about it the same way that God does. And what you're going to find is He is faithful and just. And He'll forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, let me clarify because even in talking about ask God to forgive it, there are wrong ways to do that. One of the ways that sometimes we wrongly ask God to forgive is by begging God for it. By begging God for it is as if I'll wear God down. It's kind of like a little kid with their parents. It's like, I'll keep asking, keep asking, and keep asking, and keep asking, and I'll just, I will wear them down until they give me that snack or until they give me that toy or until they let me stay up later or whatever it might be. And we keep coming back and keep coming back. But we need to understand that God is more willing to forgive than I am to ask. 
I don't have to beg because he's already made provision for it. There's another wrong way to ask, and that is bargaining. Bargaining with God for it. And sometimes it's almost like we're trying to bribe God. You can't bargain with God, right? Well, God, if you forgive me, I'll, I'll even volunteer to change dirty diapers in the church nursery, right? Or I'll start giving more money, or I'll, I'll do this, or I'll go on this mission trip, or I'll do these things. And it's, we're trying to barter with God, but it doesn't work. Because we don't have anything that he really needs. And we don't have anything that he hasn't already given to us. I don't have anything to bargain with. I don't have to bargain because I can't. And I don't have to beg because he wants to forgive. Well, what's the right way to ask for his forgiveness? And that is to believe. To believe in his perfect provision for it. Romans chapter 3, verses 22 through 25. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as the propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in His divine forbearance He had passed over former sins. How do you ask? You believe. You believe that Jesus Christ is sufficient. His sufficient in the life that He lived, a life of perfect love and perfect obedience, perfectly attuned to His Father. He died a death on a cross to pay the penalty that I deserved and you deserve because of our sin. To know that that giving of His life, that propitiation by His blood was more than sufficient to pay for my sin, to provide for my forgiveness. And it is to be received by faith. And, and in the cross, God shows His righteousness, but also His love. We need to understand that my only hope is not in begging, it's not in bargaining, it's in believing. Believing what Jesus Christ has done for me that I could have never done for myself. And when God forgives, the Bible tells us He does at least four things in that forgiveness. The first is God forgives instantly. He forgives instantly. And there, there's several examples of that throughout the Gospels. I'll just give you a couple. At John 8, when the, the, the woman called it adultery is before him. And Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Thinking about her accusers. Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go from now on. Sin no more. In a moment, in an instant, the condemnation was taken away. And not only the condemnation, but now she was set free from even the power of sin. She now had a capacity to live, not as a captive of sin, but to sin no more. Let me give you another example. In Matthew's gospel, and the, the paralytic that was brought uh, before Jesus, and, and he's lying on a bed. And when Jesus saw their faith, these friends who had brought him to them, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. In that moment, in that instant, he pronounced forgiveness. And then because folks were grumbling about that, he turned around. And if you continue reading the account in Matthew's gospel, he healed him as proof positive that he had the power to forgive sin. Please hear me. God does not want me living under guilt, but under grace. He wants to, to free me, and He forgives me instantly. But not only instantly, but the Bible tells us when God forgives, He forgives completely, completely. Colossians, Paul writing to the believers there, and you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with Him, having forgiven us all 
our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Here's the pop quiz. How many of your sins did Christ die for? The answer, all. All our trespasses. He set aside, nailing it to the cross. Some of us sometimes feel like, well, I know God can forgive, but there's this one thing. There's this huge thing, or this, there was this continuing pattern in my life, and it's, it's so bad, it's so ugly, it's so horrible that God can't forgive. But the death of Jesus Christ, His life, death, burial, resurrection is enough that He forgives instantly. He forgives uh, completely all my transgressions. But not only that, but He forgives continually. He, he continually forgives. First John, we were spending a lot of time in this letter this morning. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. You don't have to live under the dominion of sin anymore. But as we continue in this sin-scarred world and this not yet fully redeemed body, we struggle with sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever committed the same sin more than once? Have you ever asked God, forgive me for this? And then a day later, a week later, a month later, you stumbled right back in? Sometimes three minutes later, right? God forgives continually. Continually. There's this wonderful picture in Hebrews 7. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through Him. And this tells us what Jesus is doing even in this moment, since He always lives to make intercession for them. In this moment, as you're listening to the sound of my voice, Jesus Christ is continuing to intercede on our behalf. That forgiveness is not only instant, it's not only complete, but it is continual. He is continuing to intercede on our behalf. And the fourth characteristic that I want you to see is that when God forgives, He forgives freely. He forgives freely freely out of the abundance of His grace. Isaiah had a picture of this. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, that he may have compassion on him. And to our God, now here's the promise, for He will abundantly pardon. There is a, a lavishness, a, an abundance in God's forgiveness to us. Paul writing to the Ephesians says, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of His grace, which He lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. Can I just encourage you today? When God forgives, it's not as if He's just wanting to, to give out just the, the bare minimum, right? Uh, but there is an abundance. There is a lavishness out of the riches of His grace. He places His forgiveness upon us, and He does all of that because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. And so I'm just going to ask you today, what is the secret shame that you've been honed by? What is it? Maybe you've never even told another human being about it. What is that greatest regret that you're ashamed to even think about? Here's the invitation. Don't try to bury it. 
Don't try to, 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 to blame other people for it. <laughs> Don't try to uh, beat yourself up with it. But ask God to forgive. Admit it. Own it. Accept responsibility for it. And then believe Believe what God offers you in Jesus Christ because He does not want you to be continually tormented and controlled by your sin, but He wants you to be set free, set free from the fear of your past, fear of guilt, fear of retaliation, and set free to be the person that He created you to be. That's why the psalmist writes, Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity and whose spirit there is no deceit. Let's not live any longer apart from this blessedness that God wants to give us. Let's no longer let the, the enemy have his way by continually poking us and accusing us and trying to entrap us and ensnare us with guilt over our past. But let's take it under the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ and experience that forgiveness and that covering, the, the blessedness that knows that our iniquity is not counted against us because it was all charged to Jesus Christ and He bore it all upon the cross so that we can live no longer in deceit, but we can be set free. So I want to leave you with a phrase and a story. Here's the phrase, there is more grace in God's heart than there is sin in your past. Will you just meditate on that a moment? Whatever it is in your past, I guarantee you, based on the authority of God's Word and the provision of God in Jesus Christ, there is more grace in God's heart than there is sin in your past. August 29th, 1984. Shannon was a 16-year-old young girl heading off for her third day of her junior year. She kissed her mom goodbye that morning. She threw her books and pom-poms in the back of her car and she was driving to high school. She was going down the country road that would lead to the interstate. She adjusted the rear view mirror and she pulled out the lipstick for a quick touch up application. And then she saw something out of the corner of her eye and then she heard a thump. She brought the car to a screeching halt, thinking that perhaps it was an animal that had gotten out of the pasture. She got out of the car and walked back, and then she saw a horrific sight. She saw the woman laying there with curly hair and a mangled bicycle, something that she never thought she would see. And, and, and as she panicked in that moment, she, she didn't know what to do. She wanted to, to uh, administer aid, but she knew that this person needed more than she could do. And so she went to the nearest house and she called 911 and, and then called her mom and said, please come down the road. And that's all I told her, come meet me on the road. And her mother arrived and she saw what was going on and they waited for what seemed like an eternity for the ambulance to arrive. And when the ambulance arrived, uh, they quickly went to the woman and it was apparent she was already dead. And they told Shannon and her mother, there's nothing we can do. We're going to call for the funeral home. She was probably dead upon impact. Overcome with grief and guilt, her mom took her home and 
They realized that they didn't even know who the woman was or where she lived or anything about her. She was just racked with all this guilt and, and she was even thinking about suicide and all of these things. And the phone rang at their home. It was a man by the name of uh, uh, Jerry Speed. Jerry called to say that he lived next door to a woman by the name of Marjorie Jartsfer, the woman who had been killed. And that Jerry and his pastor had driven to McKinney, Texas to tell her husband, Gary, that his wife had been killed. Shannon's heart sank. This family now knows who I am and what I've done. She figured they probably wished she was dead too. The caller explained to Shannon that Gary's first response after that initial shock was to ask a couple questions. How was the girl? Was she hurt? Does she know it's not her fault? Shannon couldn't believe what she was hearing. How could this man's first response after this devastating news be concern for the one that was responsible for his tragic loss? The caller explained that Gary wanted to meet Shannon and her family and invited them to come to his home the next evening so that their families could meet. An invitation that she certainly did not want to accept, but knew that she couldn't decline. The evening arrived, and feeling his issues about to face a firing squad, Shannon entered the front door of the Jartsfors' home. She saw this big, burly, middle-aged man coming to her, not with hatred and animosity in his eyes, but with his arms open wide. And Gary grabbed Shannon and he hugged her tightly as tears flowed from both of their eyes onto his flannel shirt. And she just kept saying, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. Gary eventually took her into the living room where they sat down in this bay window. And he talked about his wife. He said, I want to tell you about Marjorie's life. We served many years with the Wycliffe Bible translators, and there was no limit to how much Marjorie loved the Lord. And she has such a close, intimate walk with God that she's actually been telling me for a while that she sensed the Lord would be calling her home soon. Shan found it difficult to fathom that a human being could have a close enough walk to God that they would know when their time on earth was about to expire. In fact, Marjorie had even taken out additional life insurance and given her testimony at church about how she was ready to leave this earth and be with her Lord any day. Gary continued talking to Shannon. Shannon said, This accident has may have taken all of us by surprise but it was no surprise to God. He was ready for Marjorie to join him in heaven, and he chose you to carry out her fate because he knew you would be strong enough to handle this, and that is your responsibility. As a matter of fact, Shannon, I'm passing Marjorie's legacy of being a godly woman onto you. I want you to love Jesus without limits, just like Marjorie did. I want you to let him use you for his glory. You can't let this ruin your life. That moment was transformational for Shannon. That act of grace, that act of forgiveness, that act of amazing love, pointed her to the God who loved her that way. Shannon did go on. Shannon Etheridge's speaker and author has written some best-selling books and is continuing to work with women in overcoming guilt-ridden, wounded lives. There is incredible power when you understand, no matter what you have done, there is more grace in God's heart than there is sin in your past. Here's my hope and my prayer for you is that you will live in the freedom, 
in the power of the love and the grace and the forgiveness of God that is greater than any of your sin. And as John wrote, uh, we, when we understand how much he loved us, we are set free because perfect love cast out fear. And when you know your love that much, you can begin to love Jesus Christ and others without limits. May you experience in the depth of your being God's grace that is greater than any sin in your past. Would you bow your heads with me as we pray today? And as we pray, I'm just going to ask you just to, to carry anything that's weighing heavy on your heart. Any sin even that God's bringing to mind right now and just bring it before Him. And ask Him to be the, the forgiver of that sin. To, to cleanse it, to cover it with the full payment of Jesus Christ. And to set you free. Free to experience His grace in the moment. Free to pursue all that He has purposed for your one and only life. And if you've never opened up your life to Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, then I, I just want to give words to a prayer that you may want to adopt these words as your own and just ask Him to forgive your sin. You can just communicate to Him, talk to Him with words like these. Dear God, I admit my sin against you and against others, that I have chosen my way, I have chosen selfishness, I have rejected you and rejected your love far, far, far too often. And Father, there's nothing I can bring to bargain with. But I believe what you say in your word. I believe what you have done in sending Jesus Christ to live and die in my place so that my sins could be forgiven, my life transformed, and my forever secured in your presence. And so, Father, today I ask you to come into my life. Come in to forgive my sin. Come in and return to your rightful place as the leader and Lord of my life. Set me free by your grace to live for your glory and to tell others of your love. I ask this believing, not in the greatness of my prayer, but in the greatness of your grace. Through Jesus Christ, in whose name I do pray. Amen. If that prayer ex expresses the desire of your heart, adopt it, adapt it as your own, and then let us rejoice with you. The Bible says there's more rejoicing in heaven when one person comes uh, to a saving faith in Jesus Christ. We want to rejoice with you. We want to help you begin to, to, to live in, in God's love and under the, the, the wonderful authority of His love and His Word. And we want to help you as a church to do that. So please reach out to us. Send us an email. Pick up a phone. Uh, talk to one of the, the staff folks or maybe a friend of yours who, who shared this message with you. We want to come alongside you and help you to continue to grow as, as a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. As we just continue on, I just give you some questions to close to make this personal. Just to begin to think about how have you typically tried to deal with your guilt in the past? Do you tend to bury it? Do you tend to blame others? Do you tend to beat yourself up? What's your pattern? What truth about how Christ deals with our guilt do you most need to meditate on this week? And maybe just did that we just got to keep preaching the gospel to ourselves. We keep need to be reminded uh, of the extravagance of His grace toward us. And will you receive God's perfect provision for your guilt by turning from your sin and trusting in God's grace gift to you in Jesus Christ? And then, of course, as we always encourage, 
Don't just keep a truth to yourself because it's not just for you, but it comes to you so that it can go through you to other people. Who can you share these truths with in a personal conversation, sharing a link or whatever it may be? If there's any way that we can help you at all, please, please, please reach out to us through our website, picking up the phone through social media. We want you to experience God's grace. Perfect love, cast out fear. I no longer have to live with fears for my past because God's grace is greater than any sin in my past. God bless you. We hope you were challenged and encouraged by today's message. If you feel that God is working in your life or if you have any questions about the sermon, we want to come alongside you. You can email us at pray at fbcfm.com. We want to thank you for your faithfulness in giving. Your generosity makes resources like this available. You can give online at fbcfm.com slash give. We want to continue the conversation with you throughout the week on social media. Thanks again for joining us today.